CBS News. This is Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Thanks, Houston Station. Good morning. This is CBS News. How do you hear me? CBS News this is the International Space Station. Welcome on board. We hear you loud and clear. Well, good morning, and it's great to be aboard. This is Peter King. Bill Harwood will be joining me in just a couple of seconds. And uh, we want to start with Commander Frank DeWinna. Congratulations, uh, first of all, for becoming uh, the first European Space Agency commander. I'd love for you to talk to us about the importance of the milestone for you personally and for ESA. Well, for me, it's, of course, a big honor to be the first European uh, space station commander, but more so, I think it's very important for the European astronaut corps. I only can get this function because uh, all the people that preceded me in uh, Europeans in space flight did an excellent job, and we have built up a lot of expertise in the European astronaut corps. But also in the European Space Agency, we have our own transportation vehicle, ATV, that deliver goods to the space station. We have our module here, Columbus, that is attached to the International Space Station. So it's really uh, good for uh, ESA that we can all now also get uh, this function as a commander of the International Space Station. And also I think for the uh, partnership it's very good because I hope soon after me also we will have representatives from uh, CSA and from uh, Japan, the JAXA Space Agency, become commander of, this, uh, of the International Space Station. And it's really a sign that this international cooperation, this wonderful project of the International Space Station, really works on all levels. Barrett, Mike, for so long we've heard about how the six-person expanded crew would make it so much easier to do much more science rather than just keeping the station flying. How's that working out, and can you give us a couple of examples uh, of uh, what's been going on? Well, I think that's been absolutely the case. Uh, I was here during Expedition 19, and we were working pretty hard uh, trying to get ready for six-person crew parley and just trying to do the scheduled maintenance and getting the station uh, ready for the increased payloads activities. And our worlds got better. Uh, once we went to six-person crew, we could become immediately more productive, and Koichi uh, Wakata and I and uh, Gennady Padalka, our workload uh, improved, which means that uh, we had a very good pace that we could sustain for the the remaining uh, four and a half months or so. There are times here when all of us are working totally different payloads, and the only challenge we have is just the number of communication lines we have to the ground. But uh, when you hear all the comm going to the JAXA Center in Japan, to Huntsville uh, here in the U.S., uh, to uh, Col CC in, in Europe, and then, of course, uh, off and on to Canada and, and uh, from the other end of the station to Russia, you get an idea that this is a very vibrant platform with a lot going on. Our payload activity has increased quite a bit. Hey, Mike, uh, guys, it's Bill Harwood at the Kennedy Space Center. Let me, let me stick with you, Mike, for a few moments if I could. Uh, you're coming home in a couple of days, so let me ask the standard reporter questions. Uh, what are you going to miss, and what are you looking forward to the most? Well, I'm really going to miss this station. There's a couple of aspects of it. Uh, just floating and flying here are tremendous, and I would say after about six and a half months up here, I can now float and fly fairly proficiently. It, it takes a little bit of time to to really adapt this, uh, what my friend Shannon Lucid would call deep adaptation to spaceflight. It really does take some time, and I think I've finally gotten there. And the Earth views are just amazing, and I'm going to miss those. Uh, as much as anything, I'm going to miss the times around the galley table with this uh, crew that we've had up here. We've just uh, really worked well together and had a tremendous fun, uh, amount of fun up here. But the big magnet on the ground, of course, is my family. I have a, a kind of a wonderful, crazy family that I've really missed a lot, and I'm looking forward to getting back with them. Hey, well, a couple more from me for you real quick. Uh, you guys were checking out the TMA-14 vehicle the other day, and I saw mention of some issue with positive-grade thrusters. That's not any kind of a problem for you guys, is it, for undocking or reentry? Well, I'm not uh, personally. I'm not even aware of uh, the technical aspects of that issue. But uh, we have certainly not been given any uh, change to our plans. Our undocking is on time. Our deorbit burn is nominal. So uh, the answer is so far uh, no. Okay, and one last one from me for Mike, and that uh, is is just as a flight surgeon. I mean, I suspect you'll find the whole readaptation process interesting. What sort of shape are you in, and how tough are you expecting all of that to be? 
Well, I would say that I'm in as about as good a shape as I could be up here. We've got a new resistive exercise machine, which I've been working on fairly diligently for the last six and a half months. And it's the first time that we really had that kind of loading in space. And we have the treadmill, of course, and the bike, and I've tried to hit every session of exercise I can. And I think I'm about as good as I can be. Uh, I'm not a young guy anymore. And uh, there are certainly some uh, challenges associated with reentry and uh, getting back to the gravity vector. But I'm uh, uh, certainly going to give it my best shot and uh, hopefully go through it okay and as always try to take meticulous notes about it. Guys, this is Peter again, and this question is for Nicole. Nicole, of course, uh, uh, a former uh, uh, worker at Kennedy Space Center. And with the shuttle program winding down right now, layoffs have already begun, not just here in Florida, but at ATK in Utah, where they make uh, the SRBs for the shuttle. Can you talk to us a little bit about the uh, institutional memory and the importance of that and the experience for uh, people who may be leaving the program uh, and the importance of that as uh, NASA moves forward into whatever the next chapter may be? Well, I, I think we've seen over time that the institutional memory is uh, hugely important. Um, we've gone through um, several cases of, uh, of layoffs in the past um, with the space program, and um, I think we've seen that we, we tend to bring those people back, we, um, and we count on um, their memories and their expertise to um, keep the new guys um, informed and keep the program going. You know, my hope with... Uh, What's going on now is that, you know, that we do our best to maintain that, that memory, that institutional memory, as you call it, and that, you know, that we minimize the impact by looking towards the, the future programs and, and utilizing those skills as best we possibly can. And another question for you, it's not often that you get to find out that you're making another space flight while you're making one, yet a couple of weeks ago, that's exactly what happened. What was it like for you to find out that you're on the final planned shuttle crew while you're actually flying a mission? Well, I think the, the first thing it was is a total surprise. Uh, it was a real shocker. Um, it was a very pleasant surprise at that. Um, you know, I, I know, and you know, Mike and I will be sharing that experience together along with uh, several of our other uh, bug class of 2000 classmates. And um, I know we're all very honored to be included in that crew, um, you know, and, and we look forward to it. Uh, you know, there's gonna be some, um, you know, sadness associated with also as well, given that it, you know, has the potential of being the last shuttle flight. But I think we all look forward to the mission and we look forward to um, doing our best to make sure that everyone knows what a wonderful vehicle the space shuttle has been. This is Bill again. Uh, let me ask this question to uh, Jeff Williams or perhaps Bob Thirst, either one. Uh, you guys are hosting uh, Guy Le Liberté this week, and I was uh, just wondering if he's taught you guys any tricks or any tumbling moves up there in weightlessness. Well, Guy definitely brings a unique aspect to the whole experience here. He's got a perspective and a completely different background than we do. We t tend to think technically about what we're doing and whatnot. And, uh, of course, he brings his entertainment uh, background, uh, his uh, art background, artist background. Uh, so we, uh, we've learned a lot from him. I think it's broadened all of our horizons. He's uh, adapting very well. Um, he, uh, in fact, he was telling me this morning he wishes he could stay for a couple more weeks because now he's just feeling very comfortable here and uh, he's ready to start teaching us some tricks. But unfortunately, he's going to have to leave here pretty soon. Let me ask one to Bob Thirsk along those lines. Uh, a comedian, Conan O'Brien, was talking about Guy's clown nose on his show the other night. He joked that you guys then had to go off and do some experiments on, quote, the loss of dignity in space, unquote. Uh, is it fun to have a chance to lighten up a bit up there? It's important. You know, um, our space agencies appeal quite well to the public that are interested in science and technology, but that's not everyone out there that's supporting the space program. There's a large arts uh, community in Canada that, whose tax dollars also go towards supporting our program. So uh, if we can reach out to them and explain why it's important to uh, venture out into space and to develop space through uh, gifted people like Guy La Liberté, I'm 100% behind it. And uh, we're going to sneak in one more question. And for Jeff Williams, since you're, you're the newbie, the newcomer, uh, how's your adaptation going there? And how do you feel about missing things like uh, the World Series, the Super Bowl, Thanksgiving, and Christmas while you're up there? 
Uh, well, actually, when I came on board, it almost it, there was part of me that seemed like I had never left. I landed uh, three years prior to our launch this time, uh, so the adaptation went very fast. Of course, the station has changed a lot. Uh, we've talked about being at a crew of six. We've added several modules since I was here before. Uh, this time I will be gone the uh, the winter and uh, spring. Last time it was the basically the summer and fall. So I'll miss the uh, the other half of the events that happen in the year. So that means that uh, we'll have missed uh, everybody's birthday at least once, uh, anniversary of course, births and uh, and other events that happen. And it's always tough to for all of us. Uh, to miss those things on board. We've got a lot of resources on board that help us stay in touch with our family and friends uh, um, so that we can at least vicariously participate in those events. So, so that helps a lot. Well, thanks very much to all of you, and, and Mike, a safe ride home in a couple of days, and uh, we'll talk with you again soon, I hope. Take care, and thank you again. Thank you very much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.